So thank you for joining us for our webinar with the Lake County Forest Preserves. Um, we're very pleased to have with us tonight Eileen Davis. Um, Eileen is an environmental educator with the Lake County Forest Preserve, and she's going to tell us all about kind of how to enjoy the preserves this winter since we're all we're probably looking for some interesting things to do. So welcome, Eileen. Well, thank you so much for having me. It's really great to be with you all tonight. Um, I am uh, an educator with the Lake County Forest Preserves and I work in the environmental education division. We have two divisions in our education department. Um, so we have a whole team of educators who operate out of the Dunn Museum at our Libertyville office and then another team of educators that provide the environmental side of uh, programming. So we're the ones that are out there in the preserves uh, teaching you all about the plants and the animals, how they all work together, the different um, projects that our biologists are working on. So that's the, the role that we play. Um, as the principal guardian of over 30,000 acres of land in Lake County, uh, we have four main pillars to our mission. The first pillar is preservation. So uh, the big thrust of our mission is to preserve open space and land in Lake County. Uh, the second big pillar of our mission is uh, restoration. So we do a lot of work to restore the land and try to bring back um, the habitats to the uh, as healthy a condition as we can. And we're aiming towards um, uh, and looking at data and historical records of what the land was like pre-European settlement. So that's uh, uh, one of our main goals. And then of course, education that I mentioned before is another pillar. And the fourth pillar is recreation. And that's a lot of what my, um, uh, my presentation is about today is both the last two, the uh, how can you learn more in the winter in the preserves and also how can you enjoy your, your, your recreation time in the preserves. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here with our presentation. I'm going to turn my video off real quick just so that um, I'm not blocking the screen. And um, this is sort of the ideal picture that I love about our preserves in winter. They, I, I, I enjoy them all year long, but they're a little bit more fun in the winter if you've got some snow. And so I, I love this picture here. So how to enjoy the preserves in winter. There's a ton of different ways that you can enjoy your time out in the preserves. We've got sledding hills, ice skating, ice fishing, snowmobiling, cross country skiing, or just plain hiking and walking through, um, through your preserves. Uh, I like to call this winter sport central um, because very often a lot of our, our winter activities are dependent on snow conditions or ice conditions. There's some safety regulations we follow. So I really recommend going to our for the Forest Preserve website um, and there's a there's a button for maps and we have an interactive map and you can click on one of the little icons over the preserve you're interested in and it'll tell you um, what you need to know. Um, there's also usually in the winter, once we start getting some snow, they pop up a little icon on our main uh, web page that you just click on that. It's a winter sports inf information hub, and it'll give you everything you need to know about ice conditions for ice fishing or skating. Um, we do have, we'll get to this a little later in the presentation, we do have some trails that they do groom um, in the preserve. So it just, it gives you all that information. And uh, very often, at certain locations that uh, allow ice fishing, skating, skiing, that kind of thing. Um, at some of the preserves or at those preserves, there'll be um, signs as at the entrance that you can see right there. Um, but you also may not wanna drive all the way out to one of the preserves and only to find out that, that the ice isn't thick enough to go fishing or skating. So check that map first. I really recommend doing that. We're gonna start with sledding. And we have two main sled hills in the forest preserves. One is at Old School Forest Preserve in the Libertyville area, and the other is at Lakewood Forest Preserve out near Wakanda. And uh, both of these areas are open from 6.30 a.m. to 9 p.m. So that's a little different. We have some extended hours at some of the, our preserves in the winter, and we'll talk more details as we go through um, the presentation. But um, really fun. I've been to both of them. And with my kids when they were younger, I will admit I haven't gotten on a sled in a couple of years. Um, I, I, I have a par particular favorite for the Lakewood um, sled hill, which is the picture on the right. 
And um, I just like that kind of clear open path and you end in a field of um, like a little marshy area that's frozen over. So it's a pretty soft landing down there at the bottom. Um, and then uh, I also like it uh, in particular, you can go sledding at night at both of these, but uh, it's particularly fun um, to, to hit that Lakewood Hill at night. Ice skating, uh, again, two designated areas within the preserve. One is at Independence Grove, and that is actually on the lake. Um, it's in the South Bay area over where the marina is, um, kind of in that general area. So if you enter the preserve, you would take the road around to your right. That, because it's on the lake, it does require a uniform four and a half inch layer of ice before they can open up the skating there. And Independence Grove, like most of our other preserves, is open from 6.30 a.m. to sunset. Out at Lakewood at the what we call the Winter Sports Area, and that is located off of Route 176 uh, and Fairfield Road. It's just a bit south on Fairfield Road. That is, um, it's got an actual skating rink. So it's not on a lake or a pond. So that one is usually, once we get consistently cold temperatures, you can um, pretty reliably skate out there but it's also within that complex where you also have the sled hill and then one of our solar lit paths for cross-country skiing and hiking is there too so that's a real neat place to go out at Lakewood if you've got a group and you all have a very different interest in what you want to do everybody can be satisfied uh, out there at Lakewood and again those are open at Lakewood they're open from 6 30 a.m to 9 p.m one note about the sled hills is that uh, snowboards or toboggans are not allowed at either um, location. Ice fishing, um, again, that uniform five, four and a half inch layer of ice is required wherever we have ice fishing. So, so that you're not disappointed, I, again, I recommend checking the website for updated information. And um, there's ice skating available at Independence Grove, at Hastings Lake, Lake Carina, um, Lakewood out in the western part of the county, and then Van Patten Woods, which is up in the Wadsworth area. Hastings Lake is out in the Lake Villa area. Lake Carina and Independence Grove are not too far from each other, um, and those are in the Libertyville kind of, and Lake Carina is closer to Gurney. Snowmobiling. Um, there are about 21 miles of trails and the trails, even if we have snow before December 10th, the trails don't open up officially until December 10th. And they run through March 31st as long as the ground is, uh, there's a four inch snow base and the gr ground is still frozen. Uh, there's a lot of different places and sort of um, um, uh, um, guidelines for the snowmobiling and it would take up a lot of a lot of slides here and uh, a lot of fine print so I would really recommend checking our website for specific locations where you can park and um, and you know I guess launch your snowmobile and out into the woods and the trails um, and there's some guidelines about where you can go and, and uh, that sort of thing so I would really recommend if you're going to go snowmobiling again, check out our website. It's got some very detailed information that will avoid you, um, you know, going off somewhere and and perhaps not being able to get on the trails after you've you've packed up all your gear and headed somewhere. And then cross country skiing is a big favorite activity throughout the county. Uh, just about all of our sites, except for Lakewood and um, Old School Forest Preserve are gonna be open from 6.30 a.m. to sunset. And again, starting November 1st through March 14th, uh, the Old School and Lakewood will stay open uh, till 9 p.m. Now at Ryerson Woods down in the Riverwoods area, we do uh, ask or require a four inch base of snow before skiing happens there, and that's to protect the trails. But quite honestly, if you do any cross country skiing at all, uh, you don't really want to go skiing with much less than that because you can really rip up the bottom of your skis. And again, I, there are a couple of trails that are groomed, but they typically um, don't groom them till after there's a certain amount of snow on the ground. So the website would be a really great, um, a really great uh, resource for finding out what trails are groomed and then also whether the skiing is open or not at certain forest preserves. And then of course, uh, just Plain old hiking and snowshoeing. Again, all preserves except Lakewood and 
old school are going to be um, the, the open until uh, sunset from 6.30 a.m. to sunset. And just as a public service announcement for the <laughs> cross-country skiers out there, um, if you're out hiking or snowshoeing, if you could um, um, be a, a courteous trail user and try to avoid walking in any ski tracks you see, because if those melt and uh, or get melt and then refreeze, um, it makes the skiing really, really tricky for folks. And last slide before we jump to the next section is uh, a little bit more information on our solar lit paths. And these are two different loops. One is at Old School Forest Preserve, which is on St. Mary's Road, just south of 176. And the other is out at Lakewood at the Winter Sports Area. And starting November 1st through March 14th, you can go hiking at night there or skiing when we have snow or snowshoeing. And they are uh, lit by solar powered little um, lamps and lights along the trail. If you look at the picture on the right, it gives you a good sense of it, it's not you know, it's not daylight <laughs> with these lights. They're small little lights, but they do light up the trail. And actually, as you walk along the trail, you can usually see the next light coming up. So it does give um, give a little bit more confidence as you're out walking on the trail and it does light it up a bit. So it's a nice evening walk. So I, I take a moment right now um, before we head into the next section, if, if there are any questions, Roz. We do. We have one question. Um, someone would like to know information about renting skis. We were talking a little bit about this earlier, Elaine, but what, what, what would someone do if they need to rent skis? So we do not rent skis in the forest preserves. And um, it has been difficult over the years to kind of keep track of all the different organizations in the county or in Cook County that do that. So we really recommend doing a Google search. Uh, but I would say you might want to check the Vernon Hills REI. I'm not sure if they do a rental program or not, but I think in the past they have. So I would call the, um, that REI store down there on uh, Milwaukee Avenue and Route 60 and just see if they've got a program or they may even have a list of folks that um, uh, can, can rent out the skis or snowshoes for you. Okay, thank you. That's, that's the only question we have at this point. Okay. All right, we're gonna keep on moving. So this next section, um, since I couldn't take you on an actual walk in a preserve uh, in the winter, and um, just a, a note on that for programming at the district, we are currently doing only virtual programming, but our preserves are open. And we have seen um, some of the highest visitation that we've ever had in our preserves throughout the last uh, nine months. We found and, and that uh, folks are really, enjoying being able to get out in their preserves and that they're a real asset to the county that, you know, during stressful times, it's really nice to be able to just kind of take a break, go take a walk, kind of collect your thoughts, take a few deep breaths. And um, it, it sort of backs up all the research us environmental educators have been learning for years about how beneficial time spent out in nature can be. And it's something that I, I am constantly poking my own children about during the day while they're online going to school every once in a while, like, let's go, let's take a break, let's get outside and, and just kind of step back from the screens for a while. So hopefully my, my virtual version will, while not being the exact same thing as being outside, it may inspire you to go outside and take some time out in your forest preserves this winter. So I'm gonna call this section the natural history of winter. And there's a few different things that you can do to sort of become a little bit more connected to the preserves and and the nature around you. And the more you know about things, the more meaningful those experiences and, those, and enjoyable those walks can be. One of the funnest things to do is uh, to go out after a snow and sort of read the stories in the snow, I call it. Um, so while we may not see all of the wildlife that is around us in our preserves, especially when we're out there during the day, most of them tend to be a little bit more secretive, though I will tell you in the winter, um, animals that you normally wouldn't see out during the day do tend to come out. They're looking for food. Um, they might be just a little bit more noticeable. So I just included a couple pictures of some different what I call stories in the snow. And uh, the picture on the left just shows us some beaver footprints leading up to a tree that the beaver had chewed. Um, the middle picture is a really lovely picture. And I've seen this a couple of times 
where you see the footprints and that looks like it may be the footprints of a rabbit and then some sort of large bird of prey has come down and um, literally stopped that rabbit in their tracks. <laughs> um, so you see the, the feather prints and the wing prints of either an owl or a hawk. And then on the far, the upper right hand side, uh, that is uh, um, sort of a, what's called a slide created by a mink. And um, otters will do this too. But in this particular case, it was a mink who was, uh, they're, they're long, they're skinny, think of a ferret, uh, but bigger. And they uh, are pretty low to the ground. So as they're moving along, they sort of flatten out the snow. And if they have a, a, a regular pattern of places they go, they'll create these sort of slides and then they will kind of just run and slide their bellies along the ground and it, it, it helps them to move a little faster. If there's anybody out there that's done skateboarding, it's sort of the same premise. You're using a little bit of energy and then you're kind of coasting along there for a while. So any, any time going out into the woods to, and it, it could be things other than just footprints or wing prints, it could be chewed up nuts. It may be a coyote has gone to the bathroom on the side of the trail, but the animals do leave signs behind and it's really kind of fun to go out and, and try to decipher. And there are a lot of books out there for on tracking. So you can also get some books. Winter bird watching is a really uh, a fun thing that I like to do, whether it's in my backyard at my feeder or out in our preserves. And we do have many birds that stay here all winter. So the birds that are migrating are migrating, not because they are gonna to be too cold. Um, they have feathers just like the birds that stay here, but because the food that they like to eat is just not available for them in the winter time. So birds that migrate are usually eating things that live in the water. If the water freezes over, you can't get to your food or they might be eating things that live down in the soil. Again, if the soil is frozen and covered in eight inches of snow, you're not gonna be able to find your food. So the birds that stay around here can survive on things like um, seeds and berries or other animals that, you know, dead things. Um, so this is just a sampling of some of the different birds that you might see or hear as you're out and about in your preserves in the winter. Two birds in particular I just kind of want to call out is up in the top left, um, the dark-eyed junco. They are only here in the winter. They migrate south and hang out with us in the winter. And I saw my first juncos coming down towards the end of October. And to me, that's always a sign like, uh-oh, winter's coming. And then in the spring, they leave and they go farther north to their nesting grounds. But they are um, real fun little birds to have around and they'll come to your feeder. They hang out on the ground usually. So they're, they're picking up all the seed that the other birds have spilled out. The other bird I wanted to call out is in the center column all the way at the bottom, the goldfinch. And um, I usually get questions from folks like, where did my goldfinches go? Or, or in the spring, they say, my goldfinches are back. Well, actually the goldfinches stay around. Uh, they just, the males lose their bright yellow plumage in the wintertime. That bright color yellow with the, with the black cap we see on the, the male goldfinches in the spring and summer, though, that's their breeding plumage. And so they molt their feathers at the end of the summer and they look a little bit more drab, but they are still here all winter long. Another really fun thing to do out in the preserves in the winter is to try to learn to identify the trees in winter. And it can be a little trickier because you don't have leaves on them, but there's some really cool uh, little uh, tricks and uh, parts of the tree that you look at that really help you to learn to identify them. And it might be the type of bark, it could be the way the branches are growing, um, the buds of next year's leaf grow in a, different, a certain pattern, the seeds and nuts that may be found uh, on or around the tree can all give you clues as to what species of tree you're looking at. And the book there that I've got is the Winter Tree Finder. It's a pocket-sized little book. You can go on Amazon and find it. If it's, uh, Roz was mentioning, it's not at your local library, um, but they're not very expensive and it's a great little pocket guide and it just asks you a series of questions about the tree you're looking at and helps you uh, narrow down your options till you get to the species. And then just a little bit of promotion I just put up on our website today, we're going to do a virtual winter tree ID class on January 16th at 10 a.m. and all the information is on our website and you can register on our website. 
Same as the trees, some of the really interesting uh, seed heads and uh, flower heads from the, the summer flowers that we had in the winter are really quite pretty and you can learn to identify those as well. So um, there's two books there on the screen, Wildflowers in Winter by Carol Levine and Wildflowers and Winter Weeds by Lauren Brown. Both of those are good resources. So when you're out in your preserves, uh, maybe it's not a wooded preserve, maybe you're at Middle Fork Savannah in, in Lake Forest or Rollins Savannah in Grays Lake and you've got a lot of prairie plants, it can help you to know what you're seeing in the field. And um, those, uh, just on another note, those seed heads that are left behind are incredibly important food sources for songbirds and um, uh, other uh, animals like voles or uh, little furry critters that eat seeds in the wintertime. Um, so in my own home garden, I leave all that stuff up all winter long. And in that, that center picture on the bottom, that's a gray-headed coneflower seed. You can see where some birds have come and already started to pick away at the seeds. And um, so if you have any of these plants in your yard, try and um, if you can just leave everything standing for the winter. It's not only a good source of food, but there could be eggs of really beneficial insects in all those plants. And you'll want those around next spring when you start your garden again. So other wildlife you may see, um, I always associate winter uh, with great horned owls. And it's their breeding season right now. They're they're right now starting in November. They uh, and you may be hearing owls calling already in your backyard, in your neighborhood, or if you've been out in any of our preserves towards dusk. They're establishing territories, um, reconnecting with their mates, and they are our earliest nesting bird in Lake County. So uh, they're getting everything all uh, figured out right now, and then they'll be on a nest with sitting on eggs in February. So Azure, I, I do have a little call that I will play for you so you know that it's a great horned owl. Um, they say, who's awake? Me too. See if you can hear that. And right now what you may be hearing are the males calling, they have sort of a deeper call and then the females will respond or one male will start calling and if he happens to be in another male's territory, the second male will call back and, um, and they'll just go back and forth. The other great thing about this time of year is that there's no leaves on the trees and at, as you're driving around the county or looking or walking around your neighborhood, look up in the trees, you may see a silhouette of a great horned owl. They're a pretty stocky bird. And if they've got their ear feather tufts up there on the top of their head, they really do stand out. Um, and when I've seen them, it's usually as the sun is setting and it's just, it's quite lovely to see a, a big owl sitting up in a tree as the sun is setting behind them. Other wildlife that you may notice more in winter and they're, uh, these are the guys that I say, they, they're, these are the guys that stay active. They don't they don't migrate and they don't hibernate. So the, the deer may become more noticeable, especially this time of year, the males, it's the deer breeding season or the rut and the male deer are, um, are just running around trying to find the females right now. And very often we'll, we'll encounter them as they're running across roads and that sort of thing. So it's good to be extra careful um, this time of year and drive a little slower as you're going by some of our open areas. But they tend to congregate more in big groups uh, in the winter time, and they may be more active during the day um, trying to find food. And their diet and their, their, their hair changes in the winter. So in the picture there, you may notice they're a little bit more drab brown, and in the summer, there's more of a reddish brown. So they grow new um, hairs. They sort of shed their summer coat, and their winter hairs are more hollow, and they help trap heat against their body. So um, it's a different kind of uh, hair that they have on their body. And also they're changing what they eat during different times of the year, like earlier in the spring and summer, they're eating softer, greener vegetation. And then in the winter, they shift over to eating buds, um, tr uh, the tender tips and branches of trees, they'll eat acorns. Um, so uh, well-meaning people often put out things like lettuce and they, things like that we'll very often find like big piles of cabbage or lettuce in the preserves. And it's folks who mean well, they, 
they want to try and feed the feed the deer, but it actually makes the deer sick. Their digestive system changes in the winter and they can no longer um, um, efficiently digest that kind of food. So it just, um, it makes them sick and, and they get no nutritional value. So it's best to let them try and, and, and figure out to find the food on their own. Coyotes and foxes may become a little bit more noticeable as well, especially as we get towards late winter, uh, February and March, the coyotes are starting to den up and, um, and start their families for the, for the, for the year. But um, you may also hear them howl a little bit more. And I think sometimes in the wintertime, we're hearing that happening because a lot of the other noises that are normally going on around us are, are a little quieter in the wintertime. Um, so, uh, but they're also establishing territories. So they may be howling back and forth between uh, groups, family groups of coyotes to, to communicate. But it's not unusual for us um, when we're out in the preserves in the wintertime, it's not unusual for me to see a coyote during the day. They're usually pretty secretive and stay away from us. Um, so I don't worry too much about them. Red foxes are just uh, really beautiful little animals. And they also may be out and about more in the wintertime during the day because they're searching for food. And then the little guy up in the top right corner, he's called a vole and he's a, a cousin of a mouse. So he's a little furry rodent. And you may notice that he's got kind of small ears and small little eyes. You don't really see his ears too much, but these are the guys that make those little kind of curving snake-like tunnels in the snow. Or, and then when the snow melts, you may see those same little sort of snake-like paths in your grass. And that's, they live in the layer um, be, uh, underneath the snow in the wintertime. And that's called the subnivian, S-U-B, subnivian layer. And it's actually warmer underneath the snow than it is on top of the snow in the wintertime. So there's a whole little uh, world going on under there. And what they're doing as they go along is they're collecting and eating the grass. Um, they get little piles of, of grass and seeds that they store in various places and that's how they survive the winter. You will sometimes see them coming up above the snow. Uh, it's pretty rare because when they are up above the snow, they're more um, exposed to predation by hawks or owls or that coyote or fox. But the coyote and fox will also hear them under there. And you may have seen this on, on nature shows where the fox kind of pounce and go head first down into the snow. And then um, they're, they're looking for these little vole guys and, and trying to catch them. And then there's a whole group of animals that I call the hibernators. They're all hibernating. And um, it's any of your reptiles and amphibians. So snakes, turtles, frogs, salamanders, toads, they're all hibernating in the winter. They are cold blooded, which means that they can't make heat in their body on their own. They rely on the heat of the sun or if they live in water, the temperature of the water to help keep their body at the correct temperature to be able to move and also to be able to digest their food. And since in the winter they can't do that, their survival strategy is to hibernate. And for animals um, like the garter snake or any of our other native snakes, they will go down underground in, um, into what are called hibernaculums. And very often they'll congregate together and, and hibernate together. Frogs, um, depending on the type of species of frog, that's a chorus frog in that picture there. It's a little tree frog, about a little bit bigger than a quarter. And they bury themselves down under the leaf litter and into the soil, so do our toads. And um, turtles will um, go down into the bottom of a pond or a lake and bury themselves down into the mud and stay there for the winter. 13 line ground squirrels are sort of the prairie equivalent of a chipmunk and they're seed eaters. They live out in our open grassy areas. Little brown bats um, will tend to, they tend to um, migrate south and then hibernate, but there have been some reports of, of hibernating colonies in Lake County in the winter. And then probably the most famous hibernator in our area of all is the groundhog. And one of the really important things to remember about hibernation is that it's, um, it's very different than an animal just sort of sleeping. They actually have a, a decrease in their body temperature. So for example, the groundhog's body temperature goes from about 98 degrees down to 38 degrees. They have a, a drastic decrease in their respiration, so their breathing rate. So the groundhog, again, as an example, would only take one or two breaths a minute. 
And if I were to find a groundhog burrow where he was hibernating and I went in and I poked him, I couldn't wake him up. <laughs> um, they, they don't respond um, to disturbances uh, by, by people. Uh, the way um, if I went in and poked a bear that was sleeping, <laughs> I could wake the bear up. So bears have a little bit of a different metabolic thing that's going on than say the groundhog. Uh, little brown bats, uh, one of the big issues facing bats right now when they're migrating is that there's a fungus called white nose fungus uh, that is moving around hibernating colonies of bats and it, um, it um, what happens is they'll wake up from hibernation before their, uh, before their uh, food items are out and about. So things like insects are what um, the bats in our area eat. And um, they wake up you know, in February or March and then they can't find food. And that's why um, we've had a, a very strong dip in the, in the bat populations and little brown bats in particular have been hit really hard by that. Um, so that's sort of the difference between, and then animals like chipmunks, um, skunks, possums, and raccoons, and even our gray squirrels will kind of go into sort of a sleepy state called torpor. And um, they're just kind of resting, but they do come out on nicer days. So, you know, when we're having a polar vortex, you're not going to see a skunk. But if we get a little January thaw and it gets up to 35, 36, 38 degrees, the skunks are going to kind of get up, stretch, you know, come out and look for some food. So they go in and out of sort of a lighter sleep pattern. Um, and so very often, especially things like chipmunks and squirrels store a lot of food so that they can sustain themselves during those periods when they don't want to be out and about. And then there's the migrators. I only have birds in this picture, but of course we all know that uh, monarch butterflies will might migrate as well. But I just wanted to show just a small handful of species of birds that because the food that they eat is not available um, in the winter time, they migrate south. And very often they're eating things, the, the little adorable bird up at the top left is called a um, black burnium warbler. And he's got a very needle-like uh, tweezer like beak. He's an insect eater. Can't find insects in the winter, so he goes south. Uh, over on the right hand side, the sandtail crane at the top and the great blue heron at the bottom. Again, they're looking for food that is either um, underwater or out in fields that might be, um, um, you know, in the soil. And so they can't access their food uh, if the water is frozen over. So if we get, um, I've had some great blue heron sightings into January, if we don't get a very severe winter where um, everything freezes over, the great blue herons just won't leave. And then the, the guy in the middle is a, a Baltimore Oriole. Again, they're gonna be eating insects and fruits and berries and those things aren't available, so they leave. And then the guy in the bottom left there, the belted kingfisher, he's got uh, that massive beak he uses to dive down into the water to catch fish. And that doesn't work if there's ice on the water. So they all migrate. Any questions so far? No, I leave, we have no other questions at this point. Okay. So just uh, before we open it up for a few more questions, uh, I just wanted to say thank you and let you know about a few of our other upcoming virtual programs at the Forest Preserves. We have a, a senior series and these are free programs for folks 62 years and older. This coming Wednesday, we have one on the Owls of Lake County at 2 p.m. You do have to sign up for that on our website, even though it's free for seniors, we do have to send you a Zoom link. And um, I noticed this morning it was full, so I added another 25 spots. So there, uh, as of this morning, at least, there was an additional 25 spots open. Thursday night, uh, we're doing a free program we, uh, through our uh, Best Bauer Dunn Museum. And it's our adult trivia night. It's at 6.30. Again, please do register. Um, they're free, but we do need to send you a link. And then our Ask an Educator Live program, our next uh, installation of that is on November 25th at 7 p.m. This one you do not need to pre-register for. The link will be on our main page of our website and our calendar and you just click on it 7 p.m. This is going to be a fun one. They're all fun but this one in particular I'm, I'm looking forward to our director of education Nan Buckart and um, 
like the woman that I think knows everything about the history, human history of Lake County, Diana Dretzky, they're going to be teaming up to answer questions, any question anybody has about the natural uh, history of the animals, the plants, the people that have been on the land, anything at all about the forest preserves. It should be a really interesting uh, session. So I encourage you guys to uh, join us for that one as well. And I can take any questions you guys have right now. Okay, great. Um, Sally, if you want to turn your camera back on, that would be terrific. Okay, there you go. Okay, great. So Eileen, what, do you, what is your favorite forest reserve? Like, what do you think is one that doesn't get like enough attention that you just think is like a hidden gem and you just love to visit? Well, I almost hate to say it because then everybody will come. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's two. Um, and the first one I'm going to say, I don't know that it's, it doesn't get enough attention, but it's just such a special place. And that's Ryerson Woods down in the Riverwoods area. It's just um, a really, really neat forest preserve. Um, every part of the year, there's something really beautiful to see there and enjoyable to do. Um, and I really like it because it, we were talking earlier about silent sports. And I really like to um, take my time. I like to bird watch. I like to look at wildflowers and all the other animals. And because Ryerson is such a high quality preserve, we have an extra a layer of protection put on by the state of Illinois. So we're also an Illinois nature preserve. So bikes aren't allowed on the trails. There's no um, sh picnic shelters for renting. There's no playground. So it's a very um, education focused and, and um, low impact use site. And it's just a real neat place, especially when my kids were little, I could just let them run the trails and not worry about a bike coming around the corner or you know something like that. Um, the other one that I don't think a lot of people know about, and it's fast becoming one of my favorites is Pine Dunes. And that is way up in the Northern part of the county near Antioch. It is on, uh, the entrance is on Hunt Club Road north of Route 173. So you're almost at the Wisconsin border. It's a really neat story. It's a piece of land that the Forest Preserve had and it was you know, on the list of um, parcels that eventually we would develop with trails and give access to, but um, we didn't have the funding at the time. But then the Illinois Tollway Authority had to do some wetland mitigation. Um, I believe it was when they were doing the Elgin O'Hare expansion. So they approached the Forest Preserve and said, hey, we can come in and restore the land and restore the wetlands on the land and also build some trails and parking lots. So we were able to open that preserve much sooner than we would have normally been able to do. And it is just gorgeous. They did a beautiful job on the restoration. It's a complex of both um, wet prairies and wetlands and there's some oak savannas in there. It's just lovely. And um, I really, at any time of the year, it's a real fun preserve to go to. Uh, but in particular, um, late summer, like August and September with the prairie wildflowers, it's just a beautiful show, absolutely beautiful show. So those would be two on my list um, that I would recommend, but uh, gosh, it's really hard because they're all great. <laughs> right. And so I, so these forest preserves, are, I just want to point this out. So they are all, they are free to enter. There's no admission charge. Right. I know sometimes at Independence Grove, there actually is a kind of a, a little office that you need to check in. And is that free to only Lake County residents? How does that work? Yeah. Um, so I believe, and I'm not sure that they've shifted anything during the, during the pandemic, but the way it has worked is if you're a Lake County resident, it's free, except on when they would have the Tuesday night concerts after 5 p.m. I think there was like a $5 parking fee for their concert, the free concerts. Um, and, but for out of county residents, there was a charge. And okay. it was usually just during the busier times of the year, they would man that gatehouse. Mm -hmm. um, and I, at some point, and I think they did change this, but at some point for out of county residents, it was just on Friday, Saturday, and Sundays because those were the busiest times. Okay, the but during the winter, all these preserves we talked about, they are all free. And one of the things that, um, just a heads up for folks that we started doing last year is in order to um, reduce the use of salt and maintenance um, time in the preserves, they did a study over a couple of years to see which parking lots were most heavily used by preserve visitors in the winter. 
And those are kept open and they're plowed and they're um, salted as minimally as they can to make them safe. But other preserved parking, other parking lots in that same location may be closed in the winter. Uh, but there is always one parking lot left over for or left open for each preserved site. I was at General Wright Forest Preserve last weekend and it was very busy and the parking lot was full and people were starting to park on like roads like not approved parking. Yeah. And that is really frowned upon. I just want to point out, you really need to kind of circle and wait for a parking spot because I noticed that if you park on kind of the road leading up to the parking lot, that's, you will get ticketed. <laughs> so our rangers, um, and that's one of the things that with the preserves have been so heavily used for the past several months. Like they had visitor counts on a, like a Tuesday, in the morning in April that were as high as 4th of July usually is. Mm. So, I mean, and people have really been using the preserves. So there have been times, I know it's happened at Fort Sheridan a lot where they actually close the parking lot and the ranger will sit at the, you know, and just turn people away until mm. another car comes out. So um, I was out, I live right near McDonald Woods and usually I just walk into it. It's up in the Lindenhurst area, but at first, I was running errands and I wanted to go for a walk. So I drove to the parking lot and it was, um, so it's Saturday morning last weekend. It was very early and the parking lot was full. And mm -hmm. I was like, okay, I guess I'll have to come back later or go park the car at home and walk in. But, um, but even so, a lot of our preserves are so large that even um, when the preserves are, the parking lots are full, you can still get a nice walk in without feeling like, you know, you're walking down a crowded city street. Oh, absolutely. Once I found a parking spot, once I got going, I was had lots of privacy and it was very quiet and wasn't like crowds of people. Yeah. And we, people are being really great about social distancing and wearing their masks when they need to. So that is like the key to keeping our these preserves open um, is that we, we know that folks and everybody has cooperated so much that we've been able to keep all the preserves open. It's been a real, a real nice thing for uh, everybody in the county throughout all of this. So we have a couple questions coming in. Um, one person writes, um, this winter is the first one for her family in Illinois. And because of this program, she now knows all kinds of great activities that she didn't even know about. So thank you very much. And she's looking forward to this winter. Her question is, um, is there a website that we can, what's the best website to know about all the preserved, all the activities happening in the forest preserves? I think you showed it kind of at the beginning, but maybe if you could, uh, maybe I can put it in the chat. Oh, oops, let me. Is there we go, okay. So just go to our main website, which is uh, lcfpd.org. You'll hit the main page and on your right hand side of the screen will be sort of a running calendar. And then we like we have like our Facebook page and stuff and all that information, but there's also little icons with um, sort of the, the updated stories or, or new information that you may need to know. So I would start there. There's also a link there to get onto our maps. Um, there's a link where I think it says your preserves and then it, you can pull up every single preserve, click on it, look at the map, learn a little bit about the natural history and the human history of each site. So that's, a, that's your best resource. Okay. We have another question. Um, someone wants to know, do hikers and cross country, wait, do hikers and cross country skiers and snowshoe users share the same trails? If not, are walking trails cleared of some snow? Good question. So a mo just about every trail we have in the district is multi-use. And um, so that's why I said, if you see ski trails, try not to walk in them, but there are, oh, I don't have a full county map, but there are four um, trails, four preserves where the trails are cleared. And those are where we have paved trails. And we try to have one in each corner of the county. So Hastings Lake Forest Preserve in Linden or Lake Villa, has a paved path and they do clear that. At Independence Grove, they do clear a paved path around, um, around Independence Grove. And I'm gonna, oh, old school forest preserve. The main road that goes through the forest preserve, there's a section that's dedicated um, and that gets cleared for cars, but there's also, on the, it's a pretty wide shoulder and that is where a lot of people uh, are able to walk, that's cleared. And then I'm blanking on my fourth one here. Which one is it? I may have to get back to you guys and have Roz put it up for me. Okay. But I'm blanking on my fourth one. Okay. This is my, my fourth paved one. Right. I'll well, get that think of it. 
there's a couple more questions that we can get to then if you mention it, we can add it at the end. Um, someone else is saying they love the Forest Preserve District. Um, thank you for all you do. And they're asking about, again, someone's asking about are there snowshoes to borrow or rent? So we did talk about that, not currently through the Forest Preserve, um, but you, could, you should kind of Google and there are some businesses around where you can do that. Is that accurate, Eileen? Yes, yes, yeah, that's okay. correct. And then also, the, someone wants to know about your upcoming trivia night. Is it nature trivia? Yes. Okay. I, yeah, that's my understanding is it's, it's nature trivia. Okay. The, we okay. have a series of free programming that we do through um, with the museum educators on the first and third Thursday of every month. Uh, we have free programming. And when the museum was open, it was free admission to the museum and then a program. And the first is... Um, is dedicated to like families with young kids. And then the second program of the month on that third Thursday would be adults. So the, the trivia is gonna maybe be a little bit trickier because it's intended for an adult audience. Gotcha, okay. All right, well, I think we answered the questions. Um, I mean, thank you so much for putting together this presentation for us. I really appreciate it. I know that our, our patrons did too. And, and I, I think, you know, it's just exciting to know all these options that we can do to keep us busy and active this winter. So thank you so much for, for joining us tonight. Sure, no problem. And if I could just ask you, Roz, when you get a chance, just let me know what our total um, attendance was with, you know, I know you did the poll of how many yeah. people you were. Yeah, I'll send you a note with that. All right, great. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. And, and yeah, um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. We hope to see you with the library programs going forward. The best place to see what's going on um, for other programs is to go to calendar.vapld.info, and that's where you can see our latest programs. So thanks for joining us, everybody. Bye-bye. All right, bye-bye. Thanks, Russ.